Have a child that's waddling like a penguin or has a foot like a golf club? Hi, I'm Krista, and most likely if you're seeing one of these findings, this child has one of those top musculoskeletal conditions of childhood that you need to know for the NCLEX. Let's get started. So let's start with conditions that are noticeable right after birth, like clubfoot. Clubfoot is a congenital deformity where the foot appears twisted, resembling a golf club. So we'll see findings like this foot is turned down and inwards like this, and it's stiff, so it's not easily returned to a normal position. So what do we do for these clients? Well, we need to prepare for serial leg casting soon after birth. This is a series of casts on the foot and leg that will help return that foot over time gradually to a normal position. So for the NCLEX, any client you see with a cast, you need to be worried about two things, skin integrity, and most importantly, neurovascular impairment. Because the cast is a hard device that can constrict nerves and blood vessels. So we need to monitor for neurovascular impairment like the six Ps, including pallor and paralysis. Those need to be reported right away to the healthcare provider. So even after serial casting corrects this condition, we still need to teach the caregivers to perform foot bracing or abduction orthosis to help prevent reoccurrence of this club foot. So another condition noticeable straight after birth is developmental dysplasia of the hip. This is when there's an abnormal hip joint leading to instability and dislocation. So because of this hip instability, the femur is actually outside of that hip socket and positioned higher than normal. This causes the affected leg to appear shorter and we will see asymmetrical thigh skin folds. So one side, the affected side will have more skin folds than the other. We'll also see positive Ortolani and Barlow maneuvers. These are tests that the provider does to test hip stability in newborns. So what the provider does is they flex the infant's knees towards their chest and then pulls them apart and pushes them back together. If you see any hip dislocation or clicking, that can indicate hip dysplasia. For infants with hip dysplasia, we need to prepare to teach caregivers about pavlic harness use. This is a device worn to promote that hip stability. So a memory trick, remember the capital H in hip, that is the position that you want those legs. So keep the legs flexed with the hips apart and that looks like a capital H. So under the harness straps, we need to worry about that skin. So we need to dress them in clothing like a t-shirt and diaper to protect the skin from the rubbing of the straps. We also need to avoid applying lotions or powders because that can cause rubbing and maceration and damage that skin. We also need to massage skin daily to promote circulation. And remember, any client wearing a device, we need to always assess skin integrity and monitor circulation. So for older children and infants with this condition, they will need to undergo a surgical hip reduction and need hip speaker casting. Now we're onto a condition mostly discovered in the toddler years. This is Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So this is a genetic disorder causing progressive muscle degeneration and weakness. So when you think dystrophy, I want you to think degeneration. So what do these clients look like? Well, we'll see this classic Gower sign. This is a hallmark sign of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So we'll see that their legs are so weak that they need to use their hands to rise. So in order to rise from the floor to a standing position, they need to use their hands to walk up their body, something like this. Then as they begin walking, we will see gait disturbances like waddling and frequent falls from that muscle weakness. This will eventually lead to a loss of ambulation by adolescence. Remember that dystrophy equals muscle degeneration, meaning this is a progressive condition with no cure. So what are these clients at risk for? Well, because they have so much weakness, we're worried about that fall risk. We are also worried because that weakness is in the respiratory muscles as well. So we're worried about respiratory infections also. So our treatment for these clients is mainly supportive. So we give corticosteroids to help delay that muscle degeneration. Because this client's having muscle weakness, we need to teach about the use of assistive devices, things like ambulation aids and wheelchairs. Then we need to promote home fall prevention and do things like removing throw rugs. Remember, they don't just have muscle weakness in their legs, but also in their heart and their respiratory muscles. So we are worried about cardiopulmonary complications like cardiomyopathy. 
then we also need to monitor for signs of respiratory infection like cough or fever because these can be deadly in these clients. So for our first NCLEX quick check, take a moment to answer these questions. What interventions do you anticipate for a child born with clubbed feet? Well, remember, with clubbed feet, we are needing to return that foot to a normal position, so they need to undergo serial leg casting. And remember, any client in a cast, we're worried about two things. that skin integrity, and very important is that monitoring neurovascular impairment and those six Ps, things like pallor and paralysis. Then how does the nurse position an infant's legs in a pavlik harness? Well, remember that hip or H. It's to the shape of the H, so the legs are flexed and thighs abducted or apart. Then what is the hallmark sign of Duchenne muscular dystrophy? Remember, they are so weak in their legs that they have to literally climb up their legs to a standing position. So that is that Gower sign. So next we're into a condition that appears during the toddler and school age years, and that's juvenile idiopathic arthritis. This is a chronic autoimmune inflammatory disorder affecting the joints. So I want you to think of this as rheumatoid arthritis for kids because the findings and interventions are super similar. So for findings, we will see joint swelling, pain, and stiffness worse after prolonged rest in the morning, just like we would with rheumatoid arthritis. Then we see systemic findings like fever, rash, and uveitis. That is the inflammation of a middle layer of the eye. So for interventions, these are very similar to those for rheumatoid arthritis. We give NSAIDs for joint inflammation like ibuprofen. Then we give disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs or DMARDs like methotrexate to treat that autoimmune condition. So for an exacerbation, what do we do? We apply compresses and give warm baths to treat that joint pain. Then splinting joints will help reduce the risk of contractures. So for exercise, we need to promote range of motion exercises to reduce that joint stiffness. We also need to encourage low impact activities. Remember, we don't want to put too much pressure on those joints. So things like swimming will help with that. Then activity modifications are needed to reduce that pressure on the joints like frequent rest breaks. So now for a condition often discovered during adolescence, which is idiopathic scoliosis. That's a lateral curvature of the spine with vertebral rotation. So for findings, we will see a visible curve of the spine where it will look like an S shape like here. Because of that curve in the spine, we will see asymmetry. So it looks like they have uneven shoulders or hips. And if you remember from gym class, they may have asked you to bend over to test for scoliosis. That is because when they bend over, you will see an apparent rib hump due to that spinal curvature. So adolescents are in that Erickson stage of developing a sense of identity. So remember, peer interaction and appearance are really important to these clients. So as nurses, we need to encourage peer interaction and discussions of feelings because they have this obvious alteration of body image due to the spinal curvature. So for moderate curvatures, they will have to wear a scoliosis brace over their torso. And these braces we need to teach are worn to prevent but not correct the curvature. So by now you've probably guessed it. Any client wearing a medical device like a brace or a cast, we're worried about those two things, skin integrity and circulation. So they need to wear a shirt under the brace to protect that skin. Then they need to monitor for skin integrity and circulation regularly. Lastly, if they have a severe spinal curvature, they need a spinal fusion surgery. So during that surgery, major blood vessels can shift and cause compression of the bowel, so we're worried about bowel obstruction. So if we see signs like vomiting or epigastric pain, we need to report those immediately. So our last NCLEX quick check, take a moment to answer these questions. What non-pharmacological interventions help JIA exacerbation? Well, remember, that's like rheumatoid arthritis, so the treatment is similar. We need to apply compresses and give warm baths to reduce that joint pain, and we splint joints to reduce the risk of contractures. Then, which activity is appropriate for clients with JIA, basketball or walking? Well, remember, basketball has a lot of jumping and that can be hard on those joints. So we want low impact activities like walking. The client should not wear anything under the scoliosis brace. True or false? Well, remember, we want to protect that skin under the brace, so we definitely want to wear a shirt. So this is false. Now you know how to master childhood musculoskeletal conditions on the NCLEX.